Hey everybody, it's Miss Elizabeth. It is Friday, so that means it's time for our 10th session of bedtime stories from Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim by Robert C. O'Brien, illustrated by Zena Bernstein, published by Athenium Books for Young Readers, which is an imprint of Simon & Schuster Children's Publishing Division. Yay! So I'm glad it's Friday. I am tired and ready for a weekend. Um, and first of all, before going to bed, it's Good to have a little reading. So uh, we are on chapter 17 now. Um, and if you will remember from yesterday, we left off with Nicodemus discussing the maze and the tests that uh, the rats have been going through at NIM and that Justin was able to get out of his cage and that the people studying him, him had actually even um, expected that that would happen. So we are going to continue on now and see what else happens. This chapter is called A Lesson in Reading. Of course, Justin did not escape that day, nor even that year. When they, Julie, put on a glove and went to pick him up, he had submitted meekly enough, and in a short time he was back in his cage. Yet he had learned some things. He had, as Julie noticed, examined the air ducts, the openings along the wall through which warm air flowed in winter, cool air in summer, and he had studied the windows. Mainly, he had learned that he could, occasionally at least, jump from his cage and wander around without incurring any anger or injury. All of this, eventually, was important, for it was Justin, along with Jenner, who finally figured out how to get away. I had a part in it, too, but all that came later. I won't go into details about the rest of our training, except for one part of it that was most useful of all. But in general, during the months that followed, two things were happening. First, we were learning more than any rats ever had before, and we were becoming more intelligent than any rats had ever been. The second thing could be considered, uh, from some points of view, even more important, and certainly more astonishing, than the first. Dr. Schultz, you will recall, had said that the new series of injections might increase our lifespan by double or more. Yet even he was not prepared for what happened. Perhaps it was the odd combination of both types of injections working together. I don't know, and neither did he. But the result was that as far as he could detect, in the A group, the aging process seemed to stop almost completely. For example, during the years we were in the laboratory, most of the rats in the contr control group grew old and sickly and finally died. So did those in B group, for though they were getting injections too, the formula was not the same as ours. But among the 20 of us in an A group, no one could see any signs that we were growing older at all. Apparently, though we seldom saw them, the same thing was happening with the G group, the mice who were getting the same injections we were. Dr. Schultz was greatly excited about this. The short lifespan has always been a prime limiting factor in education, he told George and Julie. If we can double it and speed up the learning process at the same time, the possibilities are enormous. Double it. Even now, years later, years after the injections were stopped, we seem scarcely any older than we were then. We could not detect either of these things ourselves. That is, we didn't feel any different. And since we had no contact with the other groups, we had no basis for comparison. All we had to go by was what Dr. Schultz said. He and the others were preparing a research paper about us. <sighs> hmm, excuse me, to be published in some scientific journal. So each morning he dictated the results of the previous day's tests into a tape recorder. We heard all of it though there was a lot of technical stuff we couldn't understand, especially at first. Until the paper was published, he kept reminding George and Julie of this, the whole experiment was to be kept secret. The one important phase of training began one day after weeks of really hard work at the shape recognition that I mentioned before. But this was different. For the first time, they used sounds along with the shapes and pictures, real pictures we could recognize. For example, one of the first and simplest of these exercises was a picture, a clear photograph of a rat. 
I suppose they felt sure, sure they felt sure we would know what that was. This picture was shown on a screen with a light behind it. Then, after I'd looked at the picture and recognized it, a shape flashed on the screen under it, a sort of half circle and two straight lines, not like anything I had seen before. Then the voice began. R. 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 It was Julie's voice, speaking very clearly, but it had a tinny sound. It was a record. After repeating R a dozen times or so, that particular shape disappeared and another one came on the screen. Still under the picture of the rat, it was a triangle with legs on it. And Julie's voice began again. A. 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 When that shape disappeared, a third one came on the screen. This one was a cross. Julie's voice said, T. 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 Then all three shapes appeared at once, and the record said, R. A. T. Rat. You will already have recognized what was going on. They were teaching us to read. The symbols under the picture were the letters R. A. T. But the idea did not become clear to me, nor to any of us, for quite a long time, because, of course, we didn't know what reading was. Oh, we learned to recognize the shapes easily enough, and when I saw the rat picture, I knew straight away what symbols would appear beneath it. In the same way, when the picture showed a cat, I knew the same shapes would appear, except the first one would be a half circle, and Julia's voice would repeat, C, C, C. I even learned that when the photograph showed not one but several rats, a fourth shape would appear under it, a snaky line, and the sound with that one was S, S, S. But as to what all this was for, none of us had any inkling. It was Jenner who finally figured it out. By this time, we had developed a sort of system of communication, a simple enough thing, just passing spoken messages from one cage to the next, like passing notes in school. Justin, who was still next to me, called to me one day. Message for Nicodemus from Jenner. He says important. All right, I said. What's the message? Look at the shapes on the wall next to the door. He says to look carefully. My cage, like Jenner's and those of the rest of A group, was close enough to the door so I could see what he meant. Near the doorway, there was a large square piece of white cardboard fastened to the wall, a sign. It was covered with an assortment of black markings, to which I had never paid any attention, though they had been there ever since we arrived. Now, for the first time, I looked at them carefully, and I grasped what Jenner had discovered. The top line of black marks on the wall were instantly familiar. R-A-T-S. As soon as I saw them, I thought of the picture that went with them, and as soon as I did that, I was, for the first time, reading. Because, of course, that's what reading is, using symbols to suggest a picture or an idea. From that time on, it gradually became clear to me what all these lessons were for, and once I understood the idea, I was eager to learn more. I could scarcely wait for the next lesson and the next. The whole concept of reading was, to me at least, fascinating. I remember how proud I was when, months later, I was able to read and understand that whole sign, I read it hundreds of times, and I'll never forget it. Rats may not be removed from the laboratory without written permission, and at the bottom, in smaller letters, the word NIM. But then a puzzling thing came up, a thing we're still not sure about even now. Apparently, Dr. Schultz, who was running the lessons, did not realize how well they were succeeding. He continued the training with new words and new pictures every day, but the fact is, once we had grasped the idea and learned the different sounds each letter stood for, we la leaped way ahead of him. I remember well, during one of the lessons, looking at a picture of a tree. Under it, the letters flashed on T-R-E-E, -E, but in the photograph, though the tree was in the foreground, there was a building in the background and a sign near it. I scarcely glanced at tree, but concentrated instead on reading the sign. It said, NIM, private parking by permit only, reserved for doctors and staff, 
no visitor parking. The building behind it, tall and white, looked very much like the building we were in. I'm sure Dr. Schultz had plans for testing our reading ability. I could even guess from the words he was teaching us what the tests were going to be like. For example, he taught us left, right, door, food, open, and so on. It was not hard to imagine the test. I would be placed in one chamber, my food in another. There would be two doors and a sign saying, for food, open door at right, or something like that. Then, if I, if all of us, moved unerringly toward the proper door, he would know we understood the sign. As I said, I'm sure he planned to do this, but apparently he did not think we were ready for it yet. I think maybe he was even a little afraid to try it. Because if he did it too soon, or if for any other reason it did not work, his experiment would be a failure. He wanted to be sure, and his caution was his undoing. Justin announced one evening around the partition, Going to get out of my cage tonight and wander around a bit. How can you? It's locked. Yes, but did you notice along the bottom edge there's a printed strip? I had not noticed. I should perhaps explain that when Dr. Schultz and the others opened our cage, uh, our cages, we could never quite see how they did it. They manipulated something under the plastic floor, something we couldn't see. What does it say? I've been trying to read it the last three times they brought me back from training. It's very small print, but I think I finally made it out. It says, to release door, pull knob forward and slide right. Knob? Under the floor, about an inch back, there's a metal thing just in front of the shelf. I think that's the knob, and I think I can reach it through the wire. Anyway, I'm going to try. Now? Not until they close up. Closing up was a ritual Dr. Schultz, George, and Julie went through each night. For about an hour, they sat at their desks, wrote notes, notes in books, filed papers in cabinet, uh, filed papers in cabinets, and finally locked the cabinets. Then they checked all the cages, dimmed the lights, locked the doors, and went home, leaving us alone in the still laboratory. About half an hour after they left that night, Justin said, I'm going to try now. I heard a scuffling noise, a click, and a scrape of metal, and in a matter of seconds I saw his door swing open. It was as simple as that, when you could read. Wait, I said. What's the matter? If you jump down, you won't be able to get back in. Then they'll know. I thought of that. I'm not going to jump down. I'm going to climb up the outside of the cage. It's easy. Climbed up the inside a thousand times. Above these cages, there's another shelf, and it's empty. I'm going to walk along there and see what I can see. I think there's a way to climb to the floor and up again. Why don't I go with you? My door would open the same way as his. Better not this time, don't you think? If something goes wrong and I can't get back, they'll say, it's just A9 again. But if two of us are found outside, they'll take it seriously. They might put new locks on the cages. He was right, and you can see that already we both have the same idea in mind that this might be the first step toward escape for all of us. Chapter 18, The Air Ducts. And so it was. By teaching us how to read, they had taught us how to get away. Justin climbed easily up the open door of his cage and vanished over the top with a flick of his tail. He came back an hour later, greatly excited and full of information. Yet it was typical of Justin that even excited as he was, he stayed calm, he thought clearly. He climbed down the front of my cage rather than his own and spoke softly. We both assumed that by now the other rats were asleep. Nicodemus, come on out. I'll show you how. He directed me as I reached through the wire bars of the door and felt beneath it. I found the small metal knob, slid it forward and sideward, and felt the door swing loose against my shoulder. If I followed him up the side of the cage to the shelf ab above, and there we stopped. It was the first time I had met Justin face to face. He said, It's better talking here than around that partition. Yes. Did you get down? Yes. How did you get back up? At the end of this shelf, there's a big cabinet. They keep the mouse cages in it. It has wire mesh doors. You can climb up and down them like a ladder. Of course, I say. I remember now. I had seen that cabinet many times when my cage was carried past it. For some reason, perhaps because they were smaller, the mice were kept in cages within a cage. Justin said, Nicodemus, I think I've found the way to get out. 
You have? How? At each end of the room, there's a, an opening in the baseboard at the bottom of the wall. Air blows in through one of them and out the other. Each one has a metal grid covering it, and on the grid there's a sign that says, Lift to adjust airflow. I lifted one of them. It hangs on hinges like a trapdoor. Behind it, there is a thing like a metal window. When you slide it wide open, more air blows in. But the main thing is, it's easily big enough to walk through and get out. But what's on the other side? Where does it lead? On the other side, there's a duct, a thing like a square metal pipe built right into the wall. I walked along it, not very far, but I can figure out where it must go. There's bound to be a duct like it leading to every room in the building, and they must all branch off of one main central pipe, and that one has to lead somewhere to the outside, because that's where our air comes from. That's why they never open the windows. I don't think those windows can open. He was right, of course. The building had central air conditioning. What we had to do was find the main air shaft and explore it. There would have to be an intake at one end and an outlet at the other. But that was easier said than done. And before it was done, there were questions to be answered. What about the rest of the rats? There were 20 of us in the laboratory, and we had to let the others know. So, one by one, we woke them and showed them how to open their cages. It was an odd assembly that gathered that night, under the dimmed lights in the echoing laboratory, on the shelf where Justin and I had talked. We all knew each other in a way, from the passing of messages over the preceding months. Yet, except for Jenner and me, none of us had ever really met. We were strangers, though as you can imagine, it did not take long for us to develop a feeling of comrade comradeship, for we twenty were alone in a strange world. Just how alone and how strange, none of us really understood at first. Yet, in a way, we sensed it from the beginning. The group looked to me as leader. Probably because it was Justin and I who first set them free, and because Justin was obviously younger than I. We did not attempt to leave that night, but went together and looked at the metal grid Justin had discovered and made plans for exploring the air ducts. Jenner was astute at that sort of thing. He could foresee problems. With event like this leading to every room, he said, it will be easy to get lost. When we explore, we're going to need some way of finding our way back here. Why should we come back? Someone asked. Because it may take more than one night to find the way out. If it does, whoever is doing the exploring must be back in his cage by morning. Otherwise, Dr. Schultz will find out. Jenner was right. It took us about a week. What we did, after some more discussion, was to find some equipment. First, a large spool of thread in one of the cabinets where some of us had seen Julie place it in one day. Second, a screwdriver that was kept on a shelf near the electric equ equipment. Because, as Jenner pointed out, there would probably be a screen over the end of the air shaft to keep out debris, and we might have to pry it loose. What we really needed was a light for the ducts. At night, were completely dark but there was none to be had, not even a box of matches. The thread and the screwdriver we hid in the duct, a few feet from the entrance. We could only hope they would not be missed, or that if they were, we wouldn't be suspected. Justin and two others were chosen as the exploration party. One of the others was Arthur, whom you've met. They had a terrible time at first. Here was a maze to end all mazes, and in the dark they quickly lost their sense of direction. Still, they kept at it, night after night, exploring the network of shafts that laced like a cubicle spider web through the walls and ceilings of the building. They would tie the end of their thread to the grid in our laboratory and unroll it from the spool as they went. Time and time again, they reached the end of the thread and had to come back. It just isn't long enough, Justin would complain. Every time I come to the end, I think if I could just go ten feet farther. And finally, that's what he did. <clears throat> on the seventh night, just as the thread ran out, he and the other two reached a shaft that was wider than any they had found before, and it seemed as they walked along it to be slanting gently upward, but the spool was empty. You wait here, Justin said to the others. I'm going just a little way farther. Hang on to the spool, and if I call, call back. They had tied the end of the thread around the spool so they would not lose it in the dark. Justin had a hunch. The air coming through the shaft had a fresher smell where they were, and seemed to be blowing harder than in the other shafts. 
of the head, he thought he could hear the whir of a machine running quietly, and there was a faint vibration in the metal under his feet. He went on. The shaft turned upward at a sharp angle, and then, straight ahead, he saw it, a patch of lighter-colored darkness than the pitch black around him, and in the middle of it, three stars twinkling. It was the open sky. Across the opening there was, as Jenner had predicted, a coarse screen of heavy wire. He ran toward it for a few seconds longer and then stopped. The sound of the machine had grown suddenly louder, louder changing from a whir to a roar. It had, obviously, shifted speed. An automatic switch somewhere in the building had just turned it from low to high, and the air blowing past Justin came on so hard it made him gasp. He braced his feet against the metal and held on. In a minute, as sun suddenly as it had roared, the machine returned to a whisper. He looked around and realized he was lucky to have stopped. By the dim light from the sky, he could see that he had reached a point where perhaps two dozen air shafts came together like branches into the trunk of a tree. If he had gone a few steps farther, he would have never been able to distinguish which shaft was his. He turned in his tracks and in a few minutes he rejoined his friends. We had a meeting that night, and Justin told all of us what he had found. He had left the thread anchored by the screwdriver to guide us out. Some were for leaving immediately, but it was late, and Jenner and I argued against it. We did not know how long it would take us to break through the screen at the end. If it should take more than an hour or two, daylight would be upon us. We would then be unable to risk returning to the laboratory and would have to spend the day in the shaft or try to get away by broad daylight. Dr. Schultz might even figure out how we had gone and trap us in the air shaft. Finally, reluctantly, everyone agreed to spend one more day in the laboratory and leave early the next night, but it was a hard decision with freedom so near and everyone thinking as I did. Suppose. Suppose Dr. Schultz grew suspicious and put locks on our cages. Someone, suppose someone found our thread and pull, pulled it out. This was unlikely. Near the end, tied to the spool, was six feet up the shaft, well hidden. Just the same, we were uneasy. Then, just as we were ending our meeting, a new complication arose. We had been standing in a rough circle on the floor of the laboratory, just outside the two screen doors that enclosed the mice cages. Now, from inside the cabinet came a voice. Nicodemus. It was a clear but plaintive, uh, plaintive call, the voice of a mouse. We had almost forgotten the mice were there, and I was startled to hear that one of them knew my name. We all grew quiet. Who's calling me? I asked. My name is Jonathan, said the voice. We have been listening to your talk about going out. We would like to go too, but we cannot open our cages. As you can imagine, this caused a certain consternation coming at the last minute. None of us knew much about the mice, except what we had heard Dr. Schultz dictate into his tape recorder. From that, we had learned only that they had been getting the same injections we were getting, and that the treatment had worked about as well on them as on us. They were a sort of side experiment without a control group. Justin was studying the cabinet. Why not, he said, if we can get the doors open. Someone muttered, they'll slow us down. No, said the mouse, Jonathan, we will not. Only open our cages when you go and we will make our own way. We won't even stay with you if you prefer. How many are you? I asked. Only eight. And the cabinet doors are easy to open. There's just a simple hook halfway up. But Justin and Arthur had already figured that out. They climbed up, on the, sc uh, climbed up the screen, unhooked the hook, and the doors swung open. The cages open the same way as yours, said another mouse, but we can't reach far enough to unlatch them. All right, I said. Tomorrow night, as soon as Dr. Schultz and the others leave, we will open your cages, and you can follow the thread with us to get out. After that, you're on our own. Agreed, said Jonathan, and thank you. And now, I said, we should all get back to the cages. Justin, please hook the doors again. I had latched myself into my cage and was getting ready for sleep when I heard a scratching noise on the door, and there was Jenner climbing down from above. The Cadimus, he said, can I come in? Of course, but it's getting on toward morning. I won't stay long. He unlatched the door and entered. There's something we've got to decide. I know, I said. I've been thinking about it, too. When we do get out, where are we going to go? I could not see Jenner's face in the dark of the cage, but I knew from his voice that he was worrying. I said, 
At first, I thought home, of course. But then, when I began remembering, I realized that won't work. We can find the way, I suppose, now that we can read. But if we did, what then? We wouldn't find anyone we know. And yet, Jenner said, you know, that's not the real point. No. The real point is this. We don't know where to go because we don't know what we are. Do you want to go back to living in a sewer pipe and eating other people's garbage? Because that's what rats do. But the fact is, we aren't rats anymore. We're something Dr. Schultz has made, something new. Dr. Schultz says our intelligence has increased more than 1,000%. I, I suspect he's underestimated. I think we're probably as intelligent as he is, maybe more. We can read, and with a little practice, we'll be able to write, too. I mean, I mean to do both. I think we can learn to do anything we want. But where do we do it? Where does a group of civilized rats fit in? I don't know, I said. We're going to have to find out. It won't be easy, but even so, the first step must be to get out of here. We're lucky to have a chance, but it won't last. We're a jump ahead of Dr. Schultz. If he knew what we know, he wouldn't leave us alone in here another night, and he's sure to find out soon. Another thing to worry about, Jenner said. If we do get away, when he finds we're gone, won't he figure out how we did it? And won't he realize that we must have learned to read? Probably. And then what? What will happen when he announces that there's a group of civilized rats roaming loose? Rats that can read and think and figure things out. I said, let's wait until we're free before we worry about that. But Jenner was right. It was a thing to worry about, and maybe it still is. The next day was terrible. I kept expecting to hear Dr. Schultz say, Who took my screwdriver? And then to hear Julie add, My thread is missing too. That could have happened and set them to thinking, but it didn't. And that night, an hour after Julie, George, and Dr. Schultz left the laboratory, we were out of our cages and gathered, the whole group of us before the mouse cabinet. Justin opened its doors, unlatched their cages, and the mice came out. They looked very small and frightened, but one strode bravely toward Ford. You're a Nicodemus, he said to me. I'm Jonathan. Thank you for taking us out with you. We're not out yet, I said, but you're welcome. We had no time for chatting. The light coming in the windows was turning gray. In less than an hour, it would be dark, and we would need light to figure out how to open the screen at the end of the shaft. We went to the opening in the baseboard. Justin, I said, take the lead. Roll up the thread as you go. I'll bring up in the rear. No noise. There's sure to be somebody awake somewhere in the building. We don't want them to hear us. I did not want to leave the thread where it might be found. The more I thought about it, the more I felt sure Dr. Schultz would try to track us down for quite a few reasons. Justin lifted the grid, pushed open the sliding panel, and one by one we went through. As I watched the others go ahead of me, I noticed for the first time that one of the mice was white. Then I went in myself, closing the grid behind me and pushing the panel half shut again, its normal position. With Justin leading the way, we moved through the dark passage quickly and easily. In only 15 or 20 minutes, we had reached the end of the thread. Then, as Justin had told us, it would. The shaft widened. We could hear the whir of the machine ahead, and almost immediately we saw a square of gray daylight. We had reached the end of the shaft, and there a terrible thing happened. Justin, you will recall, had told us that the machine, the pump that pulled air through the shaft, had switched from low speed to high when he had first explored through there, so we were forewarned. The trouble was, the forewarning was no use at all, not so far as the mice were concerned. We were approaching the lighted square of the opening when the roar began. The blast of air came like a sudden whistling gale. It took my breath and flattened my ears against my head, and I closed my eyes instinctively. I was still in the rear. When I opened my eyes again, I saw one of the mice sliding past me, clawing uselessly with his small nails at the smooth metal beneath him. Another followed him, and still another, as one by one they were blown backward into the dark maze of tunnels we had just left. I braced myself in the corner of the shaft and grabbed, his one, grabbed at one as he slid by. It was the white mouse. I caught him by one leg, pulled him around behind me, and held on. Another blew face on into the rat ahead of me and stopped there. It was Jonathan who had been near the lead, but the rest were lost, six in all. They were simply too light. 
They blew away like dead leaves, and we never saw them again. In another minute, the roar stopped, the rush of air slowed from a gale to a breeze, and we were able to go forward again. I said to the white mouse, you'd better hold on to me, that might ha happen again. He looked at me in dismay. But what about the others? Six are lost. I've got to go back and look for them. Jonathan quickly joined him. <clears throat> I'll go with you. No, I said, that would be useless and foolish. You have no idea which shaft they were blown into, nor even if they all went the same way. And if you should find them, how would you find your way out again? And suppose the wind comes again. There would be eight lost instead of six. The wind did come again, a half, half a dozen times more, while we worked with the screwdriver to pry open the screen. Each time we had to stop work and hang on. The two mice clung to the screen itself. Some of us braced ourselves behind them in case they should slip. And Justin, taking the thread with him as a guideline, went back to search for the other six. He explored shaft after shaft to the end of the spool, calling softly as he went, but it was futile. To this day, we don't know what became of those six mice. They may have found their way out eventually, or they may have died in there. We left an opening in the screen for them, just in case. The screen. It was heavy wire with holes about the size of an acorn, and it was set in a steel frame. We pried and hammered at it with the screwdriver, but we couldn't, could not move it. It was fastened on the outside. We couldn't see how. Finally, the white mouse had an idea. Push the screwdriver through the wire near the bottom, he said, and pry up. We did, and the wire bent a fraction of an inch. We did it again, prying down, then left, then right. The hole in the wire grew slowly bigger until the white mouse said, I think that's enough. He climbed to the small opening, and by squirming and twisting, he got through. Jonathan followed him. They both fell out of sight, but in a minute, Jonathan's head came back in view on the outside. It's a sliding bolt, he said. We're working on it. <clears throat> Inside, we could hear the faint rasping as the two mice tugged on the bolt handle, working it back. Then the crack at the base of the screen widened. We pushed it open, and we were standing on the roof of Nim, free. All right, quite an adventure going on. Look at this. We're getting so far. I hope this was a good ending to your week um, before the weekend in a good Friday night bedtime story. And I will catch up with you guys again on Monday. So thank you so much for reading with me. And I will see you then. Bye.